Hello once again wrestling fans of the world and welcome back to the Video Bros Network and another edition of Ring Respect Radio. And I'm joined here with my co-partner, my partner in crime. He is the man with the angelic voice, the throat of the goat. You all know him and love him. It's Papa Smokes. How the hell you doing, Papa Smokes? Hey, how you doing out there? Papa's here. Sounds great. Uh, we're continuing the whole isolation thing and it's uh you know hey it's given us an opportunity to uh work on a lot more content here we've had a lot coming out uh not only here on the video bros network but also uh, a lot of content coming out for prairie pro wrestling uh hopefully you've been keeping up with it papa smokes every thursday we've had a release of the lethal lottery tournament going on and so hopefully fans are enjoying that uh what are you enjoying it too papa smokes reliving those times from back in july yeah, very much. Uh, I enjoyed it when it happened, and then to have it on, up on YouTube now where all the fans can watch it is a good thing. So definitely go check that out and give it a like and subscribe. And while you're at it, why not give us a like and subscribe as well, too, and turn on the notification bell at the bottom to be notified when we release any new material right here on the Video Bros Network. So we've got a plethora of topics to go through here today. Uh, they are going to range from what makes a championship great. Is it the people behind the championship, the legacy behind them, or is it the companies that hold those championships? We're also going to be talking about recent WWE releases. Where are they going to go from here, and what championships could they help define in certain companies? And then we're going to end today with a little bit of the history of shoot fighting, leading into a little bit of modern shoot fighters in wrestling as well, too. That is going to be wonderful when we get to that topic as well, too. But we're going to start Today's show on a little bit of a sad note, a little bit of the news coming out, uh, Papa Smokes, I'm not sure if you heard about this, but the passing of Howard Finkel. Yeah, I definitely did hear about a month and a sad day for wrestling for sure. Uh, Howard was a superstar in his position and uh, he made a, a strong mark on wrestling. He certainly did. I remember growing up watching him. He was just one of those standout figures that you you don't always see nowadays. It's uh, It was always nice to see somebody that got in there, he did what he did, and, you know, he made it count. He made you remember exactly who he was out there. Yeah, that's right, Munson. He's been doing it since 1975. Uh, he started with uh, Vince McMahon Sr. in the old WWWF, and uh, a little factoid is that uh, he's the longest employee of Titan Sports when uh, Vince Jr., uh, created the company Titan Sports to represent the WWF. Uh, Howard Finkel was the first employee of that, so a 40-year man uh, with the McMahons, uh, not too bad. That's a very incredible run, and, you know, from the... From my heart and from, I'm sure, all of, all of our hearts, uh, we send out all our love and respect to uh, Howard Finkel, his friends and his family. Uh, definitely a big loss here in the world of professional wrestling. But we're going to move on with the show as usual now. So we're going to go right to our first topic. And I wanted to bring this topic up. I want to talk about championships here today, Papa Smokes. I want to talk about what makes a championship great. Uh, you know, whether it's the people behind them, whether it's the matches that define them, the legacy, or the look of the championship itself. So I wanted to go through a few of the, the major championships and then also, you know, get your input on maybe some championships that you've uh, also enjoyed over time as well, too. And the one thing I always thought about when I think about championships is not necessarily the companies that back them, but for me, it is the matches that define them and the champions that go behind it as well, too. And I mean, that can go back to just, you know, the greats that started the, the first world championship that ever existed, which dates back to 1905. I did my homework here today, Pop Smokes, and that was uh, George Hackenschmidt, the very first ever world champion of professional wrestling. Absolutely. Hack and Schmidt were one of the best. Uh, also, uh, came from, uh, you know, not to jump the gun too much, but Hack and Schmidt from a shoot wrestling background. Uh, he knew his, uh, he knew his wrestling inside and out. And when it came to uh, professional wrestling inside a ring, yeah, he was the first uh, world heavyweight champion, uh, championship wrestler, as they called it back then, back in the, the early 1900s. And 1905, to be exact, was when he won that championship and held on to it for a uh, legendary, pretty much three years running, I think, if not mistaken, only to eventually be uh, knocked off by uh, Frank Gotch, who went on to a five-year run as the world champion of professional wrestling. Yeah, the Gotches we know are, are huge, huge names in the, 
in vintage professional wrestling from the days of the past and, and also shoot fighting as well. But um, yeah, putting their mark on, on, the, on the belt that would eventually become the uh, NWA championship. That's exactly true. And that's in fact what I had in my notes next is that this is what essentially spawned the NWA. And, you know, as we know it, the NWA essentially helped spawn what we know became WCW, WWF, all the, you know, companies that we eventually started to relate to for uh, professional wrestling in a modern era and stuff like that. But uh, that, yeah, the NWA basically spawned that and that all spawns from those championship runs and those legendary men that were behind those championship runs. So that championship itself in its own, I think, you know, has to be considered one of the most prestigious of all time because it really essentially is the one that made everything we know today about championship wrestling. Yeah, you're right about that, Munson. And, uh, and, and for me personally, the, uh, the NWA championship or the 10 pounds of gold as people are referring to it now, also known as the domed globe belt uh, uh, because it has that uh, domed globe on it. But uh, uh, yeah, for me, what makes that championship is is the history behind it, the uh, the greats and the all time greats that have held that belt. I mean, we could go through a list of names from Hack and Schmidt, Gotch, up through to Rhodes, Flair, Harley Race, uh, uh, Sting, all the all the famous wrestlers that have held that belt, right up to. Uh, Nick Aldis in current day, still with that same uh, 10 pounds of gold or sweet Charlotte, as they call it now. To me, that'll always be the, the biggest and the best of the belts because of the history behind it and because of the uh, stars that have held it in the past. And what a phenomenal run Nick Aldis is having with that championship. I mean, he's almost redefining what a wrestling champion used to be in a modern era of professional wrestling. Yeah, that's right, too. Um, um, from the days of uh, the territories when the uh, NWA was a conglomerate of uh, promoters who uh, shared the one major title, they all had their divisional or regional titles that, that would be specific to where the uh, matches were taking place, but then a world champ that would tour through and take on the top guy in each uh, regional uh, territory. And yeah, that's kind of like what uh, Nick Aldis is doing with uh, forays into ROH and uh, some Japanese work and uh, his matches against uh, Cody Rhodes and uh, Tim Storm and others. And uh, he's bringing back that kind of retro idea of the uh, classy uh, champion that that, that is, that is uh, strong on the mic and strong in the ring and just a, a, a good example of what a champion should be in wrestling. Uh, you brought up uh, the Japanese wrestling, and that uh, brings me to another title that I've got on the list here, and that being the IWGP Championship, which, you know, I mean, I don't watch a ton of the New Japan stuff all the time, but everything I do watch, I find that they really push for their championship match to really be the spectacle of their events and stuff like that. They treat their championship like it's important, like wrestling should be treated, and I think that's why there is so much prestige and honor behind the I IWGP Championship. Yeah, I think so too. That that's one that's highly disputed at all times, uh, not just amongst uh, native Japanese wrestlers over there, but uh, the European and North American and uh, uh, basically global wrestlers that come to Japan for the competition, be and because they know that that's a prestigious belt. I mean, holding that that title uh, is a huge feather in any wrestler's cap. And you're in the history books, basically, if you get a big belt like that. Yeah, definitely. So, and it used to be the case with some of the uh, more North American championships. Uh, when we start to look at, we brought up WCW and also the WWF, WWE. I mean, there was once upon a time where those titles were considered to be extremely prestigious and looked upon as being the world championships in professional wrestling, especially in to the uh, 1990s and early 2000s. Yeah, and even still to this day, I think, I mean, most wrestling fans would consider the WWE title or the Universal title or whatever they're calling them these days uh, as the, the most prestigious titles in wrestling because WWE is obviously the largest global company. Uh, they have the most money and the most talent, so therefore, uh, you know, their belts are thought of as, a, as extremely, extremely valuable and prestigious. But I think we've seen in the past... I don't know, I'm going to say 10 or 15 years that uh, the, the belts seem to not hold as much prestige in the WWE. It's 
it's uh, the focus is more on having uh, having big moments in big matches uh, uh, such as uh, you know large pay-per-view cards like WrestleMania and the Royal Rumble. Uh, everybody wants their moment more than than uh, run with the belt, and, and that's just the way the business is changing a little bit, at, at least uh, in the Northeast in the WWE. It, it's definitely seeming more that way, and you know it, it can become very frustrating as a wrestling fan and stuff like that because you grew up in an era where that title, you know, that belt was held by some you know absolute legends. Like you start to think about the runs that is when you look at the 1990s, especially guys like Bret the Hitman Hart, and I mean the way he presented himself as a champion. I mean that was a fighting champion. He got in there, he gave you a you know, a hell of a battle every single time. I mean, he could make a, a broomstick look good inside the squared circle while he was champion. And, you know, you don't see that as much nowadays. It's like the, the excitement's there for that big moment, like you said. And, you know, we, we think about stuff like last year, Kofi Kingston winning the championship at WrestleMania. It was a big moment for him, big moment for wrestling fans across the globe who have been supporting him for the past decade or more that he's been with the WWE. But then, you know, the payoff just re really wasn't there. They started him off with a half-decent run. But the second that they had an opportunity for the big money and Brock Lesnar to come back, the, the title was dropped in a squash match on regular television, which really takes, the you know, all that steam right out of the championship run. It takes all the steam right out of the championship itself, too. Yeah, and that seems to be uh, WWE style right now or, or in these in these more modern days. Uh, uh, they, they are going to... Uh, they want someone deserving and who will stick around to hold the belt and someone that can uh, draw big money for big matches. And uh, uh, Kofi Kingston, I mean, he's he's worked hard in the WWE over the last 15 years or something like that. But, you know, I think of him as kind of a middle card talent, kind of a tag team type competitor. I was, I was surprised that he got a run with the belt, but not surprised that it wasn't long or, or uh, particularly storied as a, as a championship reign, so um, um, I'm not, I frankly wasn't surprised at all when he wanted to put the belt back on a, a beast like Brock Lesnar. And definitely, and I mean, I know a lot of fans are definitely going to disagree with it and stuff like that. They absolutely love Kofi, but I mean, I can look back to when I was growing up as a kid too, Papa Smokes, and you start to think about the guys, the big names that were in the WWE at the time, or WCW even, that just were never going to be the guy with the world championship. I mean, you were always going to get the same, you know, handful of what picked guys that were going to be at the top by fighting for that belt. And then you were going to have your Jake Roberts of the world and, you know, guys like that, that, you know, I mean, absolutely one of the best in the business, legendary in his own right, but never a world champion. Yeah, well, in the case of Jake Roberts, uh, yeah, for one thing, he was uh, more of a, a mid-card uh, uh, character with a gimmick and such like that. But uh, also, can you imagine being a promoter and wanting to put a major belt on a guy like Jake Roberts, knowing what we know about his personal life as well, right? Like, that probably wasn't going to fly so well for uh, him showing up for all his matches and making his dates and making his title offenses. So once again... You got to be careful with who you put the belt on. It, it can't just be anybody. And I, I had uh, favorites uh, uh, as a kid that I always thought should have held the belt until I kind of studied the business a little bit more and realized that yeah, it's not meant for just anybody, popular or not, hardworking or not. It's got to be a top level main event guy. That's who you make your champion. And let, let's go into a little bit of a similar topic, but. How does that uh, change when it comes to the independent scene? You know, we're both heavily involved with uh, Prairie Pro Wrestling here on the local scene, and we've got our own championship belt that's currently in the midst of a tournament to, you know, have our very first champion and everything like that. How does it change on an independent level when you're only able to necessarily run, say, you know, one show per month or every couple of months or something like that, you know? Does it mean that, you know, you've got to make those title uh, changes a little bit more frequently to keep fans, especially modern day fans, a little bit more interested? Or do you think there's a place for a full long run with a championship in the independency? Both, I think, really. It, it's up to the uh, management of the Federation and the, and the booking minds behind it is that... Uh, um, there's various ways to go about it. And yeah, you bring up a good point about uh, uh, 
federations that don't have a TV show on TV every single week with new content and, and a huge roster and all that stuff. But uh, I think what PPW has got going with the four rounds, the crown tournament is, is a great way to do it is you're making sure that each wrestler that gets to those final rounds, particularly the wrestler that wins the final round and wins that belt has had to march through hell to get it. And that's what's going to start building up a belt like that and a championship like that into being a, a prestigious belt in, in Canadian wrestling. I, I think it's uh, I think it's a great strategy. And uh, whether or not that current or first or second or third champion has a long or short reign um, will depend on who it is and uh, and where the uh, booking minds are going with that in the future. I think the toughest thing for whoever becomes the Prairie Pro Wrestling Champion in particular is that we have got such a strong plethora of talented individuals within Western Canada and all over Canada in general that are chomping at the bit. I mean, it's every time you go on social media right now, Papa Smokes, Prairie Pro Wrestling is being talked about, and there is a ton of wrestlers across the board right now that haven't even stepped in a Prairie Pro Wrestling ring that want to get inside that ring and eventually fight for that championship as well, too. We're we're going to never have a shortage of people going after that belt. Yeah, you're right. And that's, that's part of building up a belt is that, is that other wrestlers, other talent will hear about that championship, see that belt and want it for themselves and want to come and compete in a, in a local division, a local promotion like Prairie Pro Wrestling and a, a run with that belt. You know, that no wrestler looks better without some gold, around their waist, getting a picture taken. It, it looks good. It's promotional for each uh, wrestler and for the, uh, and for the uh, promotion itself. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to uh, the level of competition that's going to be in the ring competing for the PPW Championship. So, considering all who's left in the PPW Championship, let's uh, ask the tough question here, Papa Smokes. Do you have a favorite going forth? Someone who you think is the strongest going into that for that championship for Prairie Pro Wrestling? Uh, tough question, Munson. Tough question, that particularly because in that first round we saw some upsets, quite frankly, that I, I was not expecting, and uh, that really shook uh, shook things up for me. Uh, you know, I would have uh, I would have easily predicted uh, Al Asesino to go far in that tournament, and look what happens. He gets eliminated in the first round. So if you're asking for a favorite, I, I'm I'm thinking uh, the two strong contenders. I'm only going to narrow it down to two for now, Munson, and that is uh, one of my perennial favorites around PPW is Sheik Akbar Shabazz. I think he's got all the tools necessary to do it, and I also think a kind of <clears throat> maybe a slight underdog, maybe not, but I think a front runner to do to go deep in this tournament and possibly. Uh, become the first champion is uh, Bucky McGraw. That's a, you know, not a, a bad choice at all. I mean, Bucky definitely looking strong and everything. And now starting things up, he's got Merle Graves in his corner. I mean, he's it, he's growing in strength in that sense. And his intelligence really uh, says a lot inside that ring. I, he could end up being the, you know, underdog pick of the tournament to go in all the way. It's, it's very easily done. Uh, I also got to say there's a lot of great picks in there, but despite the fact that, you know, they could cross paths early on, I really think that Michael Allen, Richard Clark, and Jacob Creed have got to be strong front runners. And I think that, could you imagine what how kind of hell would break loose for that championship if those two were let loose into the uh, ladder match to finalize this tournament? Yeah, your, your picks are strong too. And, and, and as good as mine, I think I... I... Uh, like I say, I was a little surprised by some of the underdog and uh, and upsets in the first round. So, uh, I mean, we'll just have to wait. Uh, we got a couple more months, or whenever wrestling gets going again, we'll have a couple more months of this tournament going on, and uh, and somebody's going to have that belt at the end of it, and it's going to be great. Well, maybe what we'll need to do before we start uh, getting into the next rounds of the tournament is maybe we'll have to reach out to any of the wrestlers that are still involved with the four rounds to the crown tournament and have them come on as a special guest on a future edition of ring respect here and let us know why they're going to become the first ever prairie pro wrestling champion that's a fine idea and so let's do it 
Yeah, the uh, phone lines are always open to any of you that are still in the tournament. Reach out to Papa Smokes and I. We'd love to have you on the show moving forward. So, you know, we're talking about championships. What makes them great? You know, there's been a lot through history. Are there any that maybe aren't maybe the big spotlight ones or the ones that maybe from the territory days that you could talk a little bit about Papa Smokes that you really enjoyed growing up? Well, yeah, there's there's lots of big uh, titles there. Of course, we've talked before about how there used to be uh, other world championships besides uh, the uh, WWE and uh, and uh, you know ROH and Impact and some of the other uh, titles that have claimed the uh, world title status. But uh, uh, back in the in the territory days, certainly that uh, Texas Championship uh, uh, based out of Dallas. Uh, was a huge, huge belt to have uh, because of such a strong roster, including the, the Vaughn Ericks and the Freebirds and uh, and uh, Bruiser Brody and, and and the Funks and all those maniacs down in Texas. Uh, I know that uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling had a had a belt there that was highly contested uh, with a, a whole ton of superstars that we know, including. Uh, Rick Flair and Sting and Magnum TA and Nikita Koloff and they had their program, of course, Georgia Championship Wrestling that you could watch every week and, and that kept it fresh and kept it alive for the fans. And uh, another big one was St. Louis in the Sam Munchnik days. I uh, uh, can't remember what that actual belt was called, but uh, St. Louis, uh, for being in the middle of the Midwest, was a, a hugely, hugely hot wrestling promotion for a good 20 years there uh, uh, and uh, Harley Race and Ted DiBiase and a number of famous wrestlers have held that St. Louis belt as well uh, not to uh, not to leave out uh, Detroit and Indianapolis as, as huge regional championships as well uh, run by uh, Eddie the Sheik and also uh, and also Bruiser and Crusher up in Indianapolis and Milwaukee there that they had a, a thriving thriving promotion and a highly contested championship belts uh, in the midwest there too well definitely so moving on from there but we've got uh, our next topic is going to tie into a little bit of what we've been talking about here with championships we talked about what defines them who defines them and stuff and this goes into the a little bit of the news that re got released earlier this week about the mass releases from the WWE and we wanted to go over that list and maybe talk about which ones there are going to go on to you know have better careers outside of WWE which ones will help define other companies championships and who do we like maybe even uh we could play a little bit of who on this list we'd love to see make an appearance in Prairie Pro Wrestling while we're at it here too Papa Smokes so I'm just going to go through the list one by one and uh I think as we go along, we'll just uh, talk about that individual and uh, what we know about them and what we think uh, their chances are uh, going forward. So we uh, start the list off with uh, Rusev is the first one that I got on the list that was released. Uh, not sure how familiar you are with uh, Rusev's work and stuff like that, but I do know he had a you know a decent amount of ability to get himself over and could carry a match you know quite well. He's a sizable guy; he can move around the ring quite well. Uh, he can pull off the, uh, the the comedy while being on the serious side too. So I think he's got a lot to offer moving forward. Uh, sure that with his name status that he had there going for him, I'm sure he'll be able to do something definitely going into another company or onto the independent scene for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not going to claim to know much about a lot of the people on this list, but uh, Rusev strikes me as the most... Uh, the most over and the most famous of all these guys. And, and yeah, I, I think Rusev uh, is a, as experienced as a great performer. And I think other companies are going to want to uh, get him and work with him. I'm not sure who exactly, but uh, uh, Rusev is a, is a, is a good talent, especially for an independent or, or, a, or a larger company that just needs some uh, stars that have, that have experience on TV. I think Rusev is a, is an excellent uh, powerhouse style European wrestler, and uh, uh, he'll be a he'll be a, a, a desired uh, uh, wrestler to have in various federations, I'm sure. Oh, for sure, definitely. Uh, next on the list, I've got uh, Drake Maverick written down. Uh, some might know him from his uh, Impact Wrestling days as Rockstar Spud. 
Uh, I don't know a lot about Drake Maverick. I know WWE had brought him in. He was kind of a, he was a manager. He was a GM. Uh, I think he might have wrestled a couple of cruiserweight matches with him. I know he was always kind of more in the, I guess, the X division when it came to Impact Wrestling, if I'm not mistaken there, Pop of Smokes. So he's definitely a smaller guy. He might fit in with some of the, uh, the independent scene and stuff. I just... On a personal note, I mean, he's not a bad dude. I just don't really see Drake Maverick becoming the big breakout name of this list here and doing much more than we've seen from him already. Yeah, I think uh, uh, in, instead of being an in-ring talent, I, I like Drake Maverick as uh, as a mouthpiece. Uh, he's he's uh, good on the mic. He's funny. You can see he's like such a small, slight man that, that he doesn't, doesn't appear as a strong wrestling talent, although he has wrestling talent for sure. I see him more in a managerial role or a or a role as a commissioner or a GM of some kind because he is a smart mouth on the mic, and uh, I think uh, somebody could use him in in a in a positive sense as a as a comedy bit and as a as a talking head, so to speak, a, a, a talent on the mic. Yeah, definitely, and I, I like your uh, idea of a managerial role for him. I think it definitely works and could work for him on the independence. And you know what? That kind of ties into our manager talk from last episode, so I'm going to put a uh, thing in our uh, video right here to go back and check out last week's episode when we talked about managers as well, too, for anybody who hasn't checked that out. Uh, next on the list, this one to me I think is really big, and I'm going to say these two names together, Pop Smokes, because I think they deserve to be said together, is Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows. And these two, you know, a notoriously well-known tag team all around the world was a massive signing for WWE. And like most tag teams in WWE these days, squandered. Yeah, the WWE doesn't have a focus uh, on tag team wrestling hardly at all anymore. It's a little bit sad for me, especially when you have some good tag teams kicking around, such as Anderson and Gallows. I, I don't think they'll have any problem uh, uh uh, working again, I, I I think myself and and most fans see them going back to Japan where they were very popular and very well known, and uh, that that's where I would see them going back to New Japan. Yeah, me too, and that's exactly what I was thinking. Uh, Japanese wrestling definitely more their thing. They were definitely popular there in Japan, and I could see them doing really well for themselves there. So that would be uh, great for them and. I really see them uh, going back for a run as the IWGP Tag Team Champions. They deserve it. They're a great team. They look like a dominant team when they're inside the squared circle. And I think there's a great opportunity for anybody who brings uh, those two on. So uh, next on my list, I've got uh, Eric Young on there. Now, I know Eric Young from Impact Wrestling, and uh, I, I liked what they were doing with him in NXT when he came in and was doing the, the group of... Uh, Four are there. They were called Sanity. I mean, it was looking good. I, I actually like some of Eric Young's work. Like he had some great matches there in NXT. He's had some great runs in Impact Wrestling. I mean, he's a good Canadian wrestler. Uh, you, you know, here's a guy that I think you know maybe is just always in the wrong place at the wrong time, and he needs to find the right company that suits him. Yeah, I think you're probably uh, correct in that. Also, months and uh, I like Eric Young. I, I... I remember watching him when he was still a fledgling uh, star in, in TNA with the uh, Team Canada and all that. And uh, yeah, he, they signed him in uh, NXT as a developmental thing. And, and I think uh, kind of similar to Drake Maverick, that er Eric Young's strength is, is uh, in being a funny, engaging, uh, charismatic sort of fellow on the microphone. I, I don't know if you've seen, he used to have that fishing show on tv like he, he's, a, he's a natural performer and he's funny uh, and i think that he's he could be good in 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 all kinds of different federations after this it just again it depends on how you use him uh, he's good in the ring too but i see him uh, more as a as a spectacle kind of guy uh, uh coming in hot on the mic uh, making some jokes making the fans laugh and, and i think uh, he's cool for that I agree with you. Uh, next on the list, uh, EC3 was uh, released. I don't think he ever really even got a chance to get a start really going with WWE. They brought him in. There was all this hype that they were going to do something better with him this time around. And really, they just, it was like they were ready to just 
kick him right out from day one. He really just never got going again with these guys. Um, I don't know about EC3. I think he's got a look that works for professional wrestling, but I've yet to really watch an EC3 match that I recall walking away from and being like, you know, I'm going to be talking about that in a year's time. And it's nothing against him. It's not that he doesn't have talent and he can't wrestle or anything like that. I just, something about him just doesn't stick around as memorable for me. Yeah, part of that might be that he he hasn't had the chance against good competition yet. I think, uh, I mean, you were, you probably, uh, the same as I saw him first in the TNA when he came out as the one percenter and all that stuff. And uh, he looked good. He's got a great look, but he still seemed a little green back then. Now that's about 10 years ago, but I've never seen him develop since then because I've never seen him on a stage since then against good competition. So I think what EC3 needs to do, I think this might be a good thing for a guy like him is to uh, hit the circuit to, uh, get touring with some different companies, work with some different uh, talent and different styles and uh, go away and come up with a few new holds and come back uh, better than ever. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I think he just needs a chance against, uh, against some good competition, a, a couple of good feuds, maybe a, a couple title matches against uh, some worthy competition. And I think EC3 could put himself up there. Definitely, I definitely see the potential there for sure, and agree with everything you're saying too. Uh, Kurt Hawkins, another one on the list. I honestly, I, and this is no offense to Kurt Hawkins or anything like that, but I just I don't really see the necessary potential in this guy. I never really thought there was much there that I could get excited about. Maybe other people enjoy his work a little bit more than I do. I just he, he'll do fine for himself, I'm sure. I just can't imagine it's going to really do much for for him or for any particular company when he moves on to the independents. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I don't know his stuff so much. Uh, I, I don't think he's much of a name. Um, he'll probably have a successful post WWE tour while his name is still fresh in people's minds. After that, I, I couldn't tell you. I'm not too sure about him. There's going to be a few names on this list that I, I really won't know about. Fair enough. I'm sure you know the next name, maybe not as familiar too much with him, but then again, who is? He hasn't been around very long. Uh, they released Leo Rush after uh, signing him as a very young prospect and everything like that and having a lot of difficulty with this kid right from the start. I mean, this kid had a decent little run as the mouthpiece manager to uh, Bobby Lashley for a little while that I thought was working out really well because he comes across as one of those tiny little weasels that... You know, every time he speaks on a microphone, you just want to get in there and slap him. But when he's standing behind somebody, the physical size of a Bobby Lashley to back him up as the muscle, I mean, it was a great combination. But again, they had a great thing there that they didn't realize they had. And I, I feel like they squashed it too soon. Uh, Leo Rush was then put into being a cruiserweight wrestler. And I don't know what happened from there. And now he's uh, he's been one of the released superstars. Yeah, yeah, I, I I've seen a little bit of his stuff. He's he's small but very ac uh, acrobatic and athletic. Uh, I've heard that he was uh, kind of consistently a problem in the locker room, which which won't hurt your uh, or which won't help your uh, employment status around WWE very much. So uh, um, with a a guy like that, I could see maybe be maybe doing well in AEW, where the average size of the wrestlers is a lot smaller um maybe they could use a manager or two and uh that's i could see him doing okay there yeah i mean they've got some guys that would fit more his size and style definitely for sure over there too like uh sammy guevara comes to mind a, you know perfect example of someone who's smaller that they've been able to make a look a little bit more interesting and stuff having him at the group with jericho there so i mean there is probably something they could work in for Re leo rush if he were to head over to the aew way for sure so uh from there we've got uh heath slater is another name on the list another one i'm not going to spend a lot of time on i mean he was around for quite some time in wwe never really made much of i mean he was in that uh, trio with jinder mahal and drew mcintyre back in the day back when they were supposed to be some sort of mock boy band 
bullshit thing I, I can't even really recall but uh from there he's had you know on and off little runs with these funny little gimmicks i mean he's a comical guy i can have a laugh at some of the shit that he says but all in all i mean aside from that i just i don't see heath slater being much more than that guy that comes into an independent scene to get that little bit of a boost pop that comes from the little bit of a name he got from being on tv and then you know, giving you a little bit of a comedy act and being able to give you a, a you know, a decent wrestling performance kind of thing. Yeah, like you got to know when your biggest angle was having the WWE's longest losing streak that you're probably not going to have too much swag behind your name when you actually leave there. So, uh, actually, yeah, actually, not too surprising that one. Actually, the longest losing streak uh, thing was uh, the Kurt Hawkins, who was earlier on the list there. Oh, uh, but right, not, the, right. not that Heath Slater ever racked up the wins to <laughs> make himself have much of a boost himself either. So I think they pretty much could uh, compete for the longest <laughs> losing streak between the two of them. So yeah. uh, Next on the list, Aiden. Yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting my... Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I was uh, next on the list. I've got Aiden English written down. Uh, this is another guy where, you know, he came into NXT. He was a tag team wrestler. Uh, his partner was released eventually after they got called to the main roster. Uh, he had a sh short stint as the sidekick to Rusev during his whole Rusev Day segment that got over really well. And then he became a broadcaster on uh, 205 Live there. And, uh, you know, I actually think that Aiden English, in terms of, like, his ability on a microphone, is where he's strongest. He definitely made for, you know, not a bad commentator. The guy has a voice. He knows how to carry uh, talking for a period of time and stuff like that, not leaving dead air and everything like that. And, you know, given some time and some experience, I think he could make a decent uh, color commentator on anybody's show. Oh, that that's a great idea then because uh yes yeah, some some shows always need uh decent commentators and uh, uh if he could get his chops going at that then that's probably his best bet yeah definitely i mean we've already got a plethora of wrestlers that, you know try to find something that works for you another name uh not a really big draw in the wwe was around for a little while her name's sarah logan uh she was another one released uh she young new to the industry and stuff like that i think uh between the experience she got if she wants to still uh make a go at it i think independently she could definitely do something with it and everything like that she just needs to find herself when she gets onto the independent scene uh for me i don't i don't know what uh she has to offer just yet because i don't know enough about her she hasn't been around long enough or been in the ring long enough so i'm gonna say with this one let's wait and see with sarah logan yeah yeah fair enough there's uh the rise of the popularity of women's wrestling now that uh, she won't have to look for work for too long definitely not so uh non-wrestling talent mike kyoto referee was released by wwe i mean there's a guy who always need a plethora of referees in the wrestling industry i'm sure mike kyoto not going to have any difficulty getting himself opportunity on the independence yeah, well, 30 years with WWE as a referee, like, that's that's quite insane, actually. So the guy knows his stuff. Uh, don't know uh, who he pissed off to get fired this time after all this time, but uh, I heard there was a rumor that he was getting over some injuries and stuff and maybe not able to uh, perform in the ring as much as usual. But, uh, yeah, Mike Chioda, you're gone. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, well, I'm sure we'll see him pop up somewhere in some capacity anyway there's lots of lots of companies out there now they're always looking for somebody so uh, another set of names that we're going to say together because they were always a tag team were primo and epico colon Co the uh, colon brothers yeah. uh, they you know i mean every time i did see them get the opportunity to work they were given so many different gimmicks throughout the wwe as a tag team and never treated as a serious threat in any way but Talent wise, these guys can go inside that squared circle. I think given that they were allotted the right amount of time and allotted the opportunity to do what they do and not be restricted to be in, you know, that comedy act that puts over another tag team, I think there is some opportunity here with the with these two boys. I think so too. Uh, okay. The Cologne brothers, the they're they're uh they're third generation wrestlers from uh Puerto Rico, like they're dad is uh their dad is it their dad or their grandpa is carlos cologne the famous uh promoter from puerto rico and then you remember carlito cologne or carlito caribbean cool yes i yeah. uh, was the son 
he was the son of Carlos Colon. So those guys, you know, are kind of like the Funks or the Guerreros or the Von Erics in a way. They, they come up in a family of wrestling so that you're running around bumping in the ring when you're five and six years old and you never stop until, you know, you start having matches in, in the ring. And, uh, I mean, there's no underestimating talent and, and experience like that when you when you, all your brothers and sisters and dads and uncles and grandmas and everybody are all wrestlers. Then you're just soaking in that, that wrestling lifestyle of, from your earliest memories. So guys like that are naturals in the ring. And, uh, I, yeah, I can't see them having any problems. Uh, they could always uh, go back to Puerto Rico, of course, but if they want to make it uh, big or bigger money in the States, uh, pretty sure most uh, most promotions would be thrilled to have uh, lifetime wrestling guys like that. That might even be good an opportunity for the NWA at this point, too, because we know about the uh, legacy they like to hold, and that would be a great uh, location for these two individuals. Yeah, agreed. Uh, next, uh, we have a few more on the list. So Eric Rowan was another one on the list here. Uh, Eric Rowan, uh, you know, notorious for being in the tag team with uh, Luke Harper, who's uh, Brody Lee, who just recently uh, left WWE to go over to AEW. Uh, Eric Rowan seemingly was getting a little bit of a push towards the end of 2019 in WWE. Now it's fallen from grace. He's been released. You know, this guy, he was always that backup guy. You know, everyone always saw... Uh, Brody Lee, a.k.a. Luke Harper, is the uh, the one out of the two that was the better one. Uh, when it came to the Wyatt family, he was always that third guy. He was kind of the guy in the background all the time. I mean, the guy's got a great physical look, don't get me wrong. I just don't know if his in-ring skills are as great as they could be and stuff like that, uh, especially in a modern era. Uh, there might be some great opportunity for him. I'm sure somebody's going to want to use him in some capacity because he did have uh, quite a decent little push and a run with WWE for a while, even if it was a secondary guy. But just not sure if I feel he's going to be the standout guy out of this list here. Yeah, I can't disagree with that, Munson. Uh, I think uh, uh, Rowan has an awesome look uh, as a he looks like a wrestler he's giant he's got tattoos he's got a huge beard and he's bald but he looks scary and intimidating but that's kind of a look as wrestlers too right and a lot of wrestlers have that look and, and wwe alone has multiple guys with that look so you have to stand out a lot in order to stay around and get over and, and get your future opportunities and and Rowan either wasn't offered those or, or wasn't up to the challenge. And, uh, yeah, he's, he, he's got his walking papers now. And, and a lot of people speculating again with AEW that he might join his former stable mate. And, and, you know, they could use some big guys over there too. And maybe that might be a likely landing ground for him. Yeah. I, I mean, I have heard that rumor too, of him going over to AEW, joining uh, Brody Lee there. I think, him going to AEW is not necessarily the bad option. I think him partnering back up with Brody Lee in any capacity just, I mean, it reeks of what failed with Impact Wrestling when they started bringing over all this WWE talent and pushing WWE talent because that was what they wanted to do, make that quick dollar and stuff like that. And I think that ultimately failed Impact Wrestling. It failed WCW. And if AEW decides to continue down that path, ultimately it could be the death of them down the road too. Well, that is true, and and they said that they weren't going to do that. They said that they weren't going to be the the uh, uh, you know ground for for ex WWE wrestlers to float over and and you know resume a job there. Uh, and except that they have done that with with uh, several of the uh, prominent WWE wrestlers that have been released in the past months. But uh, yeah, I, I think you're totally right that they shouldn't. Uh, rely on that they shouldn't do it too much and the other thing about AEW is that um, with all these releases from WWE everybody's saying that AEW should pick up this guy and that guy and the other guy and, and all the guys we've just been talking about but you got to remember they only have one two-hour program a week they already have a giant roster of which they're not using half the guys on it and, uh, you know, sh should they just keep signing more and more talent and, and having less and less talent that can be featured on their shows? I, I really think part of their problem that they need to get over is is uh, is settling on a, on a proper roster of some guys that they're actually going to 
develop, actually give a chance to work to, and then cut off some of the dead branches. Uh, some of these, uh, I don't know if I should name names or not, but some <laughs> of these uh, lower lower card preliminary talent that that are kind of there for jokes and they're there for humor and and they don't really uh, they don't really toe the line with a lot of hard work and a lot of hard matches. I say get rid of them and, and, and focus on your stars and start developing some and, and don't just sign everybody that comes from WWE. Comments like that, Papa Smokes, are going to get you lightly kicked in the shin, you know it. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's one guy who was on my mind there too that just, I don't know if, if he's a, a Orange Cassidy is going to be a, a talent in the future or not. Everybody says he can wrestle, but he, he seems to refuse to and I don't know. I, I don't think you have time in this business to, to just wait on stuff like that. I think they should be uh, getting uh, their getting their talent in competitive matches and uh, getting a, their brand of wrestling over on TV. Definitely so. And, uh, you know, hopefully they will uh, get that all figured out because, I mean, the more wrestling out there, the better it is for all of us. I mean, I have nothing against all these other companies. There's stuff I like from every company and stuff I'm always going to watch from every company. And, you know, that's going to be the case all the time. So we'll see what ends up uh, happening moving forward for them. But, you know, I, I completely agree that they need to take a focus on certain guys and, you know, say this is our roster and stop worrying about who WWE released. Maybe let these guys go to the independents and rebuild themselves on the independents and stuff. And then, you know, maybe when the time is right before WWE strikes re-signing these guys back, Sign them then as they're starting to get red hot and bring them in as a red hot talent added to your roster at that point to, you know, really just mix it up and get something a little bit different. Yeah, I agree with your strategy, Munson. Uh, you can't just take them based on their WWE laurels. They, they have to reinvent themselves. Uh, like I say, go away for a while, change your look, learn a couple of new holds and come back with a new attitude and, uh, and yeah, I think your chances are so much better. Speaking of needing a new attitude uh, or a new look or anything on the this list, another one that was released was No Way Jose. I really couldn't give a damn about this guy while he was with WWE, and it's nothing to do with him. I tried so hard to watch this guy's matches and be interested in them, and the gimmick just really did not fly with me i could not get behind it i wasn't interested in it and the guy himself i mean strip away the bullshit that he was doing in terms of a gimmick it's not like he was a bad talent inside the ring i mean he's athletic he's young he can move he's got style obviously um there is potential in him i just the whole no way jose thing could just i could do without it i don't need jokes like that in wrestling it's not for me personally i know it's for other people but you know, I want to see this guy go re completely reinvent himself and come up with something else. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't have much to add to add to that. I I've seen a couple of his matches. Like you say, he's he's young. He's a big guy. He's got some moves. He's got uh, some wrestling talent. But yeah, what what are you gonna do when when WWE gives you a, a crappy gimmick like that and and it makes no sense and it's not particularly funny and and so, yeah, he, he needs to come at it from a new uh, perspective, and we'll see what happens with him in the future. For sure. And the last few names I got on the list aren't ones that I think are going to, you know, they they may do something, not too sure. Uh, Mike and Maria Canellis, I mean, really didn't see much happening with them when they re-signed with WWE. Uh, they were doing well for themselves over in Impact Wrestling, so there, you know, there might be some capacity within somewhere like Impact, Ring of Honor, something like that, that could work for Mike mm -hmm. and Maria moving forward. And then on top of that, we've got Zack Ryder is the last one on the list. I mean, Long Island Ice-T. I, I see him as a future all-star when it comes to being a YouTuber. I mean, the guy had a great YouTube channel for himself uh, during his uh, WWE run. That really was a run spent at home collecting money on a contract where he never had to wrestle usually. But, uh, you know, the guy's funny. He's charismatic. Um, he can wrestle. Don't get me wrong. I just don't really see him pushing forward now with anything that's going to differ from what we've seen out of them and stuff like that. So I think, you know, maybe the world of hosting, YouTubing, something like that might be in the future for Zack Ryder. Well, that sounds good. Then that, that's what he should focus on. Uh, uh, he's made a little bit of a name for himself. Uh, maybe he can launch that into a successful YouTube platform and, uh, 
Yeah, I wish him all the best, but uh, he ain't a WWE guy no more. Definitely. So that's the list that I had here anyway, Papa Smokes, and uh, we don't want to carry on too long with this topic. We want to get on to our last topic of the day, but if you were to take this list, look it over again, uh, whether you're picking a tag team or one individual, who would you like to see make an appearance in Prairie Pro Wrestling? Um, I would go with EC3, managed by Drake Maverick. I, I think that's a combo that should stick together. The we know that those guys are good buddies outside of the ring. I, I think they probably met in TNA Impact, uh, uh, you know, 10 odd years ago when they both first started there. And uh, I've seen some of their shenanigans. Uh, I, I'm not a huge comedy and wrestling fan, but I think these two have good chemistry together and I think they work well together. And uh, I think they should, they should stay as a duo and that's who I would like to see in the PPW EC3 managed by Drake Maverick. Man, that's a that's an excellent pick. It wasn't even what I was thinking, Bob, with spokes, but now I almost I almost want to just pick what you pick because now I, I I'm on board with that. I I think we need to get on the phone and get this uh, hooked up already. So I was actually going to yeah. pick Eric Young because I think Eric Young is definitely, yeah, I mean, he's a great Canadian wrestler. Uh, there's a lot of great potential there. I think he can be entertaining. I think there's a fit for an Eric Young match on a PPW event. Yeah, that would be a lot of fun, I think. I like Eric Young a lot. Uh, I hope he continues in wrestling, and I hope he does well. And uh, if he could make a stop in PPW, I'd be absolutely thrilled by that. Definitely. So so uh, that's going to be enough of that in particular topic. That was uh, more WWE than I like to talk about in one given week usually. So uh, we're going to move on to uh, the retro, more retro-ish type part of the show, but we're going to include some modern stuff as well today too. We're going to be talking the topic of shoot fighters in wrestling and the history of shoot fighting in wrestling. So I'm going to turn it over to Papa Smokes for a little bit to uh, give us some background when it comes to shoot fighting in wrestling. Sounds good, Manson. Well, the pro wrestling that we know uh, came out of uh, was a development from uh, shoot wrestling from the earlier parts of the 19th century and the late part of the 18th century. Um, it derives from catch wrestling, which is a combination of Russian sambo, karate, uh, kickboxing, and judo, basically. Uh, they, they used to throw matches. Uh, I'm going to talk about mostly uh, North American history here just uh, because it's uh, more local to us, I guess. Uh, in North America, it started, uh, uh, there were shoot fighting matches being thrown. Uh, we all know as Carl Gotch uh, as an as a extremely influential uh, figure in both shoot wrestling and professional wrestling. Uh, he went to Japan and worked out hard in the dojos there, uh, learning various styles, blending various styles into the what he found to be the perfect grappling style. Uh, a lot of the Japanese, even their top wrestlers, uh, were very impressed by Gotch. It started calling him the god of wrestling. Um, and he started... Uh, he started uh, uh, shoot wrestling... Uh, to be formed into pro wrestling uh, in Japan. <clears throat> His most prominent student was Antonio Inoki, as we all know, as the huge uh, uh, main promoter for New Japan wrestling uh, way back when in the 60s and 70s. Uh, Inoki uh, took his teachings from Carl Gotch, made it into, uh, he, into more of a, the pro wrestling style as we know it today. Uh, he named that style Japanese strong style because it used uh, uh, much more uh, uh, reality uh, and, and uh, grappling-based moves, uh, lots of hard suplexing, lots of uh, uh, Greco-Roman wrestling as well in that. Uh, and Inoki became a, a famous teacher as well, and, and some of his students uh, notably include uh, Tatsumi Fujinami, uh, Fujiwara, we all know his holds, Funaki and uh, Takata, uh, major, major wrestling and fighting stars in, in the Japanese uh, country. But in America <clears throat> and in North America, shoot wrestling basically starts with Dutch Mantel. And I'm not talking about Dutch Mantel that we know from our era, the uh, 
hairy guy that's been in the WWE recently as, as Jack Swagger's manager and such. Not him, but the original Dutch Mantel was from uh, Amarillo, Texas in the early part of the 1900s, uh, maybe from the 10s to the 30s kind of thing. And he uh, he was another one of these innovators that took what, what Gotch had, had taken from shoot wrestling and started developing a, a ring style for uh, professional wrestling. The guys wanted to start, uh, the promoters wanted to start a, a style that, that would have elements of shoot fighting, but didn't have so much uh, long bouts of grappling and, and mat wrestling, which which didn't pack the people into the uh, venues and it didn't uh, make for very exciting wrestling to the to the people that don't know grappling. You might remember how the UFC first started in those first uh, five or six cards. Uh, some of those matches were 25 minutes long with yeah. long bouts of grappling on the mat. So they, they wanted to change stuff, make it a little more exciting, make it a little more stand-up. Same thing happened when... She, wrestling a, a transition into pro wrestling some of those early promoters want to start to uh, having some more exciting spots having some of the wrestlers get more of their flashier moves in maybe working into uh, uh, finishes which which would make the matches not so long as well and, and better for the the fans uh, attention span kind of thing uh, Dutch Mantel uh, most notably uh, taught Roy Welch uh, his whole grappling style. Roy Welch, of course, is, is is head of the Welch family, who are probably the <clears throat> probably the biggest and most successful American promoters of wrestling. Uh, maybe aside from the McMahons, but I think uh, the Welches had uh, territory and uh, many more uh, separate promotions that they were running. Uh, I think at one point Roy Welch was running. 12 states so if you think about that that's that's not 12 territories or 12 cities that's 12 states that we're running shows uh, uh a lot of those once a week the guy just drove around in a cadillac back and forth all around the south to all these promotions he had started uh, roy welch also taught his entire family who, who of course there were, there were many many boys all the boys in that family learned how to shoot, fight, and how to grapple for real, uh, based on the teachings of the original Dutch Mantel. So uh, Roy Welch is a is a huge character in the in in the history of uh, shoot fighting and shoot wrestling in America. Um, kind of as an offshoot of that, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Eddie Graham. The, big promoter in the 60s and 70s and 80s in the, in Florida. He ran most of Florida, including Miami, Tampa. And uh, he's a famous, famous character. If you ever uh, get to watch some matches or read up on some stuff about a, a crazy guy in wrestling, that's Eddie Graham, a very no-nonsense businessman, also a shooter. He had a gym in Tampa, Florida that they called the Snake Pit where they, they did their TV tapings there, and there was always a ring set up there. And there were, <clears throat> quite often in the daytimes, there were uh, wrestlers working out there. And these would be wrestlers with a shoot background, uh, guys that knew some kind of real wrestling or martial arts or real grappling. And uh, and uh, quite often, the, you know, the fans knew where this building was because they went to the tapings there. So sometimes in the daytime, Fans would come by and want to wrestle or want to be taught or want to get in the ring and muck around with the guys a little bit. Uh, this uh, facility was called the Snake Pit, by the way, uh, for good reason. But uh, the Snake Pit was, was the site of many brutal beatings and, and stretchings of, uh, of fans and wannabe wrestlers. Uh, I've heard a number of grisly stories about... Uh, some of the things that happened in the snake pit to uh, to uh, unsuspecting uh, folks that would come in and, and want to play in the ring or want to want the boys to show them a few things. Uh, the guys were not nice about it. And uh, one of the uh, probably the most prominent story of what happened in the snake pit at that time was uh, the beginnings of, of young Hulk Hogan, who was from Tampa, Florida. He came down. 
a big kid, obviously, a bodybuilder, a surfer, uh, playing in a band and all that stuff. And he came in and thought he was pretty cool and thought he had a pretty good shot at uh, making it. And uh, these wrestlers that hung around the snake pit, and including uh, Jack and Jerry Briscoe, Bob Roop, Ron Fuller, Danny Hodge, Hiro Matsuda, these were all good wrestlers and really tough guys. And and I know it's not a popular thing amongst fans nowadays, but these guys were were uh, had a gatekeeper mentality. They they wanted to weed out the the wannabes and the uh, people that they didn't think were going to make uh, proper wrestlers or strong wrestlers. So they were pretty rough on some of these uh, folks that came down to try and learn how to wrestle. And uh, Hulk Hogan was the victim of of one of those too. He had approached. Uh, famous Japanese wrestler Hiro Matsuda out of the snake pit said I want you to train me can you show me some stuff I'm already probably looking pretty good and and, and something about his uh, demeanor uh, struck Matsuda in the wrong way so he uh, showed Hulk Hogan a couple rules a couple of uh, holds and uh, promptly broke his leg on purpose <laughs> Hogan went away with a broken leg, didn't know why this had happened or anything, came back again, and uh, Matsuda broke his leg again. <laughs> but he kept coming back, uh, all credit to Hulk Hogan, he was tough, that's the only reason the guys ever accepted him, is because he kept coming back with uh, with a different attitude and, and uh, coming back tough, so that's probably why he eventually he got his good training. That's what uh, probably got him dubbed the uh, nickname Terry the Boulder at the time, too. Yeah, maybe. He's, but, um, yeah, that snake pit, there There are some clips on the internet. Uh, I know modern wrestling fans uh, are kind of, kind of don't like this, this era of wrestling and this style of uh, gatekeeping, but that's how they kept it real down there, down there in, in uh, Florida under Eddie Graham. And uh, some people paid the price for that, but, uh, uh, the 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 wrestlers that they recruited were also uh, pretty tough and got the best training. If you could last through that, you you might be uh, you might be one of the greats. But at the same time, I, I mean, I don't blame them to a certain degree too. And what a lot of people don't realize is that when you first show up to come and do any sort of in ring training or anything like that, I mean, it's one thing to sit there and say wrestling's for everyone. Let's let everyone have a chance. Yeah, we'll let everybody have a chance, but not everybody you know, has it to keep going, doing it and stuff like that. They don't realize the intensity or the level of, uh, you know, respect that you need to have for what you're doing inside that ring and, you know, the respect you need for yourself, for your opponents, everything like that and all the safety involved that you need to be a certain type of person in order to be able to handle it out there and have these other wrestlers trust you when you're inside the squared circle. Yeah, that's just it. And I think that, a lot of those uh, promoters and wrestlers at that time were thinking that the more wrestlers there are out there, the less opportunities there are for the for the for other wrestlers to get booked, make money, make their name, and uh, and set themselves apart from everybody else. So if uh, if some of the uh, some of the uh, rest, some of the folks that weren't too sure if they wanted to be that or weren't too sure what their direction was going to be in wrestling that then some promoters and wrestlers consider that a waste of time and they don't want this person wasting time getting paid on a card when, when somebody better could be getting that money or that booking. So yeah, it was a gatekeeping of sorts and, uh, and, uh, fans nowadays look down upon that stuff. And, and indeed there were some, some brutal practices going on back at the time that you really don't wish on anybody. But at the same time, uh, uh, I think the the business was stronger for it. So the, the the America's roster of wrestlers in general was stronger for that kind of thing, and uh, you didn't have some of these uh, some of these joke wrestlers that come out that that have a little gimmick and think it's funny and think it'll be over for a little while or something like that, and then after that they're just taking up taking up a spot on the card for someone else and taking a uh, performance uh, money purses from uh, from more serious wrestlers. So uh, I don't know the the jury's out on that. It's it's everyone's opinion to themselves, I suppose. But uh, back then they they weeded out the the ones that uh, weren't strong enough to make it. 
Definitely so. And, uh, you know, you did mention about the early days of the UFC and stuff like that, uh, being, uh, recognized with, uh, shoot fighters and stuff like that. And now they wanted to make it more interesting. Uh, a lot of those guys have, over the years have actually transitioned into professional wrestling too. Like you start thinking about the early days of the UFC, you had your Ken Shamrocks, your Dan Severns, a uh, couple of guys that definitely made that transition over from, uh, shoot fighting, uh, UFC type stuff, MMA over into pro wrestling and bringing that style along with them too. Yeah. And always, uh, always out of uh, collegiate style wrestling, Greco Roman or freestyle wrestling, uh, always stars coming up from that and making the jumps into professional ranks, some with, with more success than others. But of course the Bob Backlund's and the Kurt angles and, and even guys like, uh, Dolph Ziegler and stuff like that uh, benefited from having that having that skill in in uh, competitive Greco-Roman wrestling. And you know, and we've got a lot of that even uh, within our own ranks and stuff like that too. Our very own uh, Mitch Clark with Prairie Pro Wrestling, Papa Smokes, uh, well known uh, for his time in MMA. He was a uh, former UFC fighter, did very well for himself there, and now has made the transition to professional wrestling. Yeah, yeah, and it's funny because. Uh, uh, I'm very impressed with Mitch Clark, but uh, he doesn't uh, he doesn't wear his UFC experience on his sleeve. He he's, uh, he has a different look and a different style of re- of wrestling, but uh, you still see nods to it. You can still see the the uh, wrist and arm control he gets on opponents. You can see by his takedowns, he uses the judo style takedowns, and just a pleasure to watch somebody blend the two styles uh, so seamlessly, like Mitch Clark. Oh, he's been an absolute gem to have along on our roster and stuff. Uh, you know, and there's a lot of great talents out there that are making those transitions. Uh, some that, you know, obviously come over for the uh, name status. I mean, there was a lot of rush with Ronda Ro- Rousey making her sign to WWE and immediately being yep. forced into the ring. They had to train her within a quick span of time. I mean, it, I'm sure it helps having that fighting background and stuff like that to transition, but it definitely not exactly the same. And some either have it or they don't. Uh, I don't know what your opinion on Ronda Rousey was. I think she picked up on it quickly and had she maybe wanted to do it longer, I think maybe there could have been some success there. But I really think the biggest issue is, is, you know, where the hell is she? Yeah, I, I think part of the problem with Rousey was that, and, and, and with some other uh, MMA fighters that make the jump into pro wrestling, is that it, it is another style of fighting. But I think you have to unlearn some of your habits as well in order to succeed in pro wrestling. I think there's some um, stuff that is instinctual with uh, with MMA fighters that that you have to learn to do a different way. I think that was that was difficult probably for someone like Ronda Rousey who has been fighting her whole life. She didn't take it up when she was 20 years old or something. She's been doing judo since she was a little girl. You know when you're when your grandpa's judo Jean LaBelle, you're going to grow up to be a fighting person. Uh, no question about that. She was a, she was a warrior all the way. And then when it came to uh, pro wrestling, it, it's, it's still fighting, but it's a different style. And I, I think she, she struggled a little bit with that. I think she was coming along pretty nicely too, but um, uh, yeah, I think her desire was not there. I, I think she, uh, wasn't ready for the uh, the level of uh, visibility and fame that she had, and uh, I just think she wanted to step away for a little while. Obviously, she has. Uh, are there plans for her to come back in the near future? Did I hear about that, uh, Bobby? There's been all sorts of rumors floating around. There was rumors that she was going to come back at WrestleMania this year to interfere with the Becky Lynch match. Seeing as it was Becky a year ago that had taken the title off of Rousey, and we haven't seen Rousey since. Uh, again, that plan, whether or not that actually was a plan in place, uh, might have got squashed by the fact that there was no audience. So, I mean, really, you wouldn't have had the same impact that it would have had in front of, you know, like a 70, 80,000 person capacity crowd. So I'm really sure that if there is plans to bring her back, I think that they'd be smart to hold back for a little bit and have the impact happen in front of a nice, large live audience. Yeah, okay. That that sounds completely logical then, uh... So we don't know, I guess, but uh, like you were saying, I, some have it and some don't, I think. And there, I've noticed Japan is one place where uh, 
all kinds of fighters seem to seem to move between styles more more easily and more fluidly than they do here. I, I was thinking of uh, Takada and Sakuraba. Like those are two famous famous fighters from the more from the '90s kind of in Japan. But they did uh, they did kickboxing, they did karate fighting, they did uh, uh, Greco-Roman style wrestling and, and MMA wrestling, and then they did pro wrestling too. And it was just it didn't matter to guys like that which style they had to work uh, from night to night. They they were just naturals in it, and, and uh, I always appreciate the the uh, MMA style fighters that that appreciate pro wrestling as a form. And we'll go into it. Uh, I, I was watching some of uh, Major League Wrestling MLW recently, and they they've signed that King Mo, who of course was a UFC and uh, and uh, uh, other types of MMA fighter and, and yeah he's not uh, he's not perfectly comfortable in the wrestling ring yet but he's had quite a few matches and uh, as a guy he, he's a performer he looks good he, he plays it up and uh, I like the movement I think that's where a lot of people think uh, some of the future of excitement in pro wrestling is, is in having uh, shoot style fighters in the ranks such as Brock Lesnar which uh, Really make for an unpredictability for the for the fan in in what's going to erupt in any particular match and uh, and uh, yeah I think that's what's exciting about it too and that's why uh, stars like Brock Lesnar are so huge and I think uh, now that we'd be uh, really uh, doing ourselves a dishonor here on the video if we didn't mention Matt Riddle of NXT, also a shoot fighter that came over from MMA <laughs> and uh, has made that transition. And, you know, I got to say personally, a big fan of Matt Riddle's work so far. Yeah, well, let me make this blunt. Month. He's a fan of, <laughs> he's, I'm a fan of his as well. And, uh, yeah, he's a guy that he's got that big personality. He's got that uh, charisma and uh he's taken to the to the sort of catch as catch can style of professional wrestling as well and uh i think he's got a great future uh we'll see where what wwe does with him in the next while but uh i think he just might have the stuff to get into some main events oh definitely so if they use them in the right way so uh that's uh been a great talk about uh, shoe fighters and wrestling here papa smokes uh, we're running a little bit over time here today so i think we're gonna leave it at that for this uh week anyway and uh hopefully everybody enjoyed the show i uh, got any uh final last words for the fans out there no just everybody uh watch your old wrestling and watch your current wrestling and stay safe in your home until we're able to come back come back out and i'll see you guys at the matches Definitely so, and we want to thank you once again for taking the time to let us into your homes here. Uh, the Video Bros Network, we're always putting out new content. Hopefully you enjoy what we do, so give us a like, give us a subscribe, hit that notification button down below so you know when we release new material right here on the Video Bros Network. And as always, you can also catch myself and Papa Smokes over at Prairie Pro Wrestling on YouTube, where we are the commentators and also the guys behind the camera, the Video Bros themselves. So go check out our work there and continue to support our work here right on Ring respect so that we can continue to make this show and many more shows in the future we love doing this for you guys thank you once again for tuning in and we'll see you next time